morning, everybody. I'm Joe Beatty. I'm glad to have you all join us today for another installation of Flyleaf, our occasional conversation with uh, friends and authors of the Historical Research Office in the Office of Archives and History. I'm glad to have with me today uh, my colleague, Chris Southerly from the Underwater Archaeology Branch. And uh, he's going to tell us, we're going to, I think, have a ranging discussion about the history of underwater archaeology in North Carolina and, um, and whatever else comes to mind. So, um, Chris, why don't you kick us off? I'm going to say, uh, Joe, I appreciate being here. And yeah, I thought the, to kind of kick everything off, and give someone an idea of you know, a little, little bit of context because you know, we've been around as an office for quite a long time, but you know, some people know about us. A lot of people don't even realize that, that we exist as, as part of the state. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd start with uh, just a little quick slideshow uh, if, it's, if it's coming up on the screen and the, just give you a little bit of background. Uh, and then we can kind of take our chat from there. And yeah. I, I like to do things informally. I don't, I don't want this to feel like it's a lecture or anything like that. Um, you know, we're, we're having a conversation and this is gonna be fun. And so, you know, if, if something comes up along the way, uh, feel free to, to interject at any point in time, but you know, we kind of scroll through here. And uh, give everybody and Chris, a little bit of context. And I, you know, I, I skipped giving you a, a proper introduction. So let, let me let me pause for a second to do that. So um, <laughs> I got on a roll and started rolling too fast. Um, so Chris Southerly uh, joined the Office of State Archaeology in 2000 and is currently Deputy State Archaeologist, Underwater and Diving Safety Officer, directing the Underwater Archaeology Branch the Queen Anne's Revenge Conservation Lab, and he's also responsible for supervising identification, inventory, evaluation, and management of submerged archaeological resources throughout the state, and curation of associated archaeological artifacts and data. Chris did his graduate work in historical archaeology at the College of William and Mary before completing his master's degree in maritime history and nautical archaeology with the program in maritime studies at, at East Carolina University. He's worked on and led terrestrial and underwater projects in the mid-Atlantic US, southeastern US, and abroad, including contract research and regulatory archaeology. Sorry for uh, skipping that important part. Oh no, that, that's fine. The, uh, the, the, yeah, I've, I've been at this quite a while now between starting as a terrestrial archaeologist and then migrating over to, uh, to underwater. So a little bit of background, the, you know, our, the underwater archaeology branch is part of the uh, also state archaeology. And you know, we are all within the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources now. Uh, who, changed its name and identity over the, the decades from, I believe, archives and history originally to cultural resources and, and now as we are now. Uh, under, uh, un under the supervision of the Underwater Archaeology Branch is also the Queen Anne's Revenge Conservation Lab uh, for, for dealing with the, primarily with the artifacts from that project. The, our branch actually began in 1962 and was officially established in 1968, called for a professional, professional staff um, by a general statute passed at that point in time. But where we came from was the, the blockade runner modern Greece, uh, civil war period that was lost off of Fort Fisher in June of 1862. And the 100 years later in 1962, some Navy divers were down on vacation at Curie Beach, Carolina Beach, and we're looking for a place to dive. And the locals said, well, there's that old blockade runner out there. You can go dive that. Long story short, they went out, they dove on it, they found it uh, pretty much wide open, kind of torn open with cargo and everything intact. And what ensued was a joint project between the, the Navy, the Coast Guard, uh, the Department of, I believe it was Archives and History back then, and the to 
uh, go about the, the documentation, the, the salvage of artifacts from the modern Greeks. It, about about 10,000 artifacts were recovered over uh, the summers of 1962 and 1963. And it was determined that and while these things coming out of a marine environment, they need to be conserved and stabilized someplace that they needed some place for that to happen. So a small lab facility was established at the Fort Fisher Historic Site, and uh, which is still part of our office buildings 60 years later. And one permanent individual, Leslie Bright, was the conservator back at that point in time to deal with those artifacts. As I said, in, in 1967, we became official. Uh, General Statute 121 was established, uh, calling for the establishment of a uh, professional staff, as well as establishing clear title to the public of North Carolina for anything abandoned and embedded in public navigable waters, inland and out three nautical miles from the low tide line on the beaches uh, as, as property of North Carolina uh, and our responsibility as a department to, to manage for the, for the public well-being. So, you know, their words, but what does that entail? Is like, it's a huge amount of area. Almost 10% of the state is water in North Carolina. So anything, um, the departmental attorneys have gone back and determined that navigable waters was defined back in the 1700s as anything that you could float a fur laden canoe on uh, and and make passage so you know, we have over 37,000 linear miles of navigable navigable waters inland and this doesn't include the that three mile band along the coast in in that area so we've, we've got more than that um, you know and again it's kind of fun north carolina has more water than the state of Connecticut has, period. Um, but I have to say, I love that. I think I told you before, I, mm -hmm. my friend who lives in Connecticut, I called him up real quick and said, ha, ah, guess what? Guess, guess what? Uh, we, we've got more, more water than you have land. And, and of course, I'll, you know, the, the sounds that we have you know, contribute greatly to that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. It's like it's not, not even Rhode Island, the smallest state, but we, you know, we go up to you know, Connecticut even <laughs> as, right. as having more, more water than they have you know, property. Um, well, I but... think it's, <laughs> I, oh, I, 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 love, I love that map because you know, when I think, I, uh, and I suspect I'm not the only one, when I think underwater, for some reason, my, my first instinct is to think you know, down east, and is to think mm -hmm. in the seaboard waters, probably salt water. And I, you know, looking at this, it reminds me there's plenty of water, uh, plenty of fresh water. There's plenty of things that would be considered underwater in places mm -hmm. far from the coast. Um, and uh, wow, I, I love this I guess, map. I can say, yeah. And, and it is, you know, a lot of our work has focused on. The, the marine or the saltwater, the brackish areas, you know, along the coast, because that's where a lot of the activity took place. But we do have sites um, up in Rockingham County and the Dan River. Uh, we look at things like the, the fish weirs that are up there and you know, anything that is in the water that is man-made, man-modified uh, falls with un within anthropology and archeology span that, that we look at as, as part of the office. And the other thing, the you look at this network of, of streams and, and rivers, and it's good to remember that the, the rivers and waterways were the highways for communication, travel, commerce, you know, right on up into the 20th century, uh, pretty much until the railroad came in and the road system then in the, in the latter part of the, of the, the, or the middle part of the 20th century, um, you know, if you wanted to get someplace, you went by water. That was the best way to go, the most efficient way to go. Um, you know, New Bern to Edenton could take you four or five days by road in colonial times, but, you know, you were covering twice the distance, but you could do it in maybe three days by sailing around through the sound. 
and you avoided those old corduroy roads and swampy areas and all those marshes and hummocks that's in eastern North Carolina that to, to navigate around. So unless you had a storm out on the sound, it was a, it was a pretty nice trip uh, yeah. and the most efficient way to do that. The, uh, so, but, you know, we had, you know, as, as is, it seems to happen a lot of times, laws were passed, but then there wasn't any money for staff. Uh, and it wasn't until 1971, 1972, when uh, Gordon Watts was hired as the North Carolina's first underwater archaeologist. And I like to jokingly say that, that Gordon and, and Leslie Bright were kind of the, the Batman and Robin or dynamic duo uh, working on the archaeology and doing things up for like the next five to eight years before, uh, before more staff uh, came in. And one of the things, they had two staff, but we had no budget. We had no money that came in as part of the, the legislation. The laws were in place. So one of the things that Gordon looked at doing was partnering up with the different universities. And one of the first partnerships that he had was with Duke University. They were doing some offshore survey work, uh, geophysical and looking for hard bottom, looking for potential wrecks out there. And the, as, as part of that, they located the, the USS Monitor, uh, which in 1973, and our office uh, participated in, in the research and management from its discovery until about 1984, 1985, when NOAA officially uh, established a, a base of operations in Newport News to manage all of the, the aspects of the monitor. So, you know, we've, you know, right, right from the get go, we've, we've been participating uh, with some of these. Now, not just Duke University, but between 74 and 1977, uh, our office ran field schools to, to train students in underwater archaeology with UNC Wilmington. Uh, UNC Wilmington already had a well-established marine biology program, so they had the boats, they had the divers, they had the, the training aspects. And they're just you know, about 20 miles up the road from our office, so it was a, it was a logical fit there and, and worked really well. Um, between 77 and 79, kind of transli transitioned over to working with East Carolina University and doing some research in the colonial ports, some survey work, magnetometer, side scan, sonar, uh, to, to look at the targets and, and study some projects there. And it's actually the because of the success of some of these field projects with East Carolina is uh, the ECU Maritime Studies program was established or founded by one of the history professors there, Dr. Bill Still and Gordon Watts. And, and at that point in time, about 1982, Gordon actually resigned as the state underwater archaeologist and moved to ECU. I began working there to, as a professor and started establishing the program. Um, so, and at that point in time in the, in the early 80s was also a transition that we had from doing individual projects uh, in, the, in the rivers and the sounds uh, with the universities, looking at sites and wrecks and things like that to more of a broader resource management type of perspective. And that in part was due to the, the evolution of the regulations. Uh, you can see here the you know, federal, federal regulations, the National Historic Preservation Act, uh, which was put in place in 66. Um, it, it evolved and kept being amended. 1980 was a, was a major mark in that where some amendments and changes were made. 79 was the establishment of the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. Um, and then various other state uh, regulations that many of which just mirror the federal regulations, but applying to state property as well as federal property and undertakings. And so management became more important, uh, primarily because of development and what was going on in the state. And a good example of that is the North Carolina shallow draft inlets, uh, Lockwood's Folly being one here that's in Brunswick County, uh, not too far from our offices, where the uh, federal government, Corps of Engineers, is, is dredges to maintain these channels for navigation. And because of 
changes and additions to the federal regulations, the uh, it was required that federal action, federal permits, any federal funding, that those actions would have no, those undertakings would have, have to have no adverse effect on potentially significant cultural resources. That had been in place on land, but it's now, it was now being translated to the water too. So these dredging activities needed to be uh, looked at. And you can actually see in this photo, uh, that's some of the, the structure of the Bendigo, which was a Civil War period wreck, uh, buried under the sand in the inlet, but part of it sticking up. And that's one of the Corps of Engineers dredge boats that was maintaining the, uh, the inlet. And you see the channel marker, literally how close the channel runs to, to some of these wrecks. In addition to the regulatory compliance, we started doing more comprehensive surveys. Uh, we did a Civil War shipwreck survey off of Fort Fisher. This was kind of an outgrowth of some of the work that was done with UNCW in the, the 70s, uh, with the students diving on a, a lot of those wrecks, expanding out on that original modern Greece shipwreck that was there. And that actually led to the establishment of one of the first underwater um, historic districts. Uh, was this, I think the full name is the Cape Fear Civil War Discontiguous Shipwreck District or something along that. If you actually look up the whole, the whole title, uh, but, but the work in the early 80s and, and prior to that uh, work is, ended up in the establishment of, of a shipwreck district on the National Register in 1985 as, as a part of our work and management. That's fascinating. So it's, yeah. it, it, it's parallel to uh, like the National Register Historic District in Wilmington in downtown Wilmington. Mm -hmm. It's sort of similar way. That's fascinating. Yeah, very and, and exactly. It's like you're you're already anticipating a joke uh, because about the same time, uh, our office we looked at the Wilmington waterfront, Eagles Island, uh, directly across from downtown Wilmington was a and Wilmington itself was a hub of naval activity. The naval stores industry from the colonial period and shipping and commerce, you know, right on up into the 20th century. We still have the primary state port just south of downtown uh, here in Wilmington for, for the state of North Carolina. And so we, we did a waterfront survey there and a lot of abandoned and derelict vessels uh, that were identified. Some were identified, some were, were just barges and, and such that didn't really have a, a ship identity per se. Uh, but what that resulted in, talking about the Wilmington Historic District, uh, 37 of 37 shipwrecks, on, primarily along Eagles Island, although you can see a few right along the Wilmington waterfront um, that were added to the Wilmington National Register Historic District as contributing properties. To the, to the social and historical context of, um, of downtown Wilmington. Now, That's, we don't, I, yeah. I find this, yeah, I find this fascinating. I mean, this is, this is really cool, you know, that, that a, um, uh, a shipwreck would be a part of a, a contributing factor to a historic district. Of course, it makes sense when you think about it as a whole, but right. um, it, I, I don't, it, anyway, we'll have to come back to this. I think the, I, that, I photo that, that photo that you had before of the, uh, of the pieces yeah. Or, yeah, sitting here in the, um, on the shore, you know, we've seen things, I think any of us who've gone to the, to the shore at all have seen things sort of reminiscent of this, whether it's driftwood or, or some uh, lost piece of something floating around. Um, mm -hmm. But to think that these are, uh, you know, artifacts uh, is, anyway, I, I find this fascinating. We'll, we'll come back yeah, to that. I can say, I, yeah, I, di I didn't include a picture of it, but there's, uh, there's a stern wheel steamer, the AP Herc, that uh, ran the river, ran the Cape Fear River up the, to Fayetteville back and forth, um, that it literally sits, I don't know if my cursor, if everyone can see my cursor as I move it around, along the screen, actually sits on the bottom. Uh, right, let's see, where, actually right about here uh, at, the, at the end of Water Street in Wilmington. It's actually, um, actually here at, at, Orange, at the foot of Orange Street. 
it's a, it's a full full length stern wheel steamer like the, the river paddle boat like you'd see in the movies that would go up and down the mississippi you know we had versions of those here in uh, in north carolina plying the waters you know just literally sitting on the bottom right there um you know and and no one knows about it unless you know unless you go and look so it's uh you know there, there's a lot of hidden history uh, under under the waters and in fact the, that was actually the name of that we put on the our little exhibit building that we had for a while it was hidden beneath the waves was the was the the name and kind of the moniker that we put on that so yeah i know our we're we're part of archives and history but you know as archaeologists we also deal with prehistory prior to european contact and the so we've dealt a lot with uh, dugout canoes uh, originally in the, the 70s and 80s and and we've had a um have them had them almost literally pop up here in recent years uh, but one of the first major projects we had was at lake phelps pedigree state park near somerset uh, historic site the in you know eastern eastern northeastern north carolina uh, where we have literally you know at least five thousand years of human occupation and the, the prehistoric dugout canoes uh, these are whole, these are fragments, and they range anywhere from, you know, 10 or 12 feet long to 30 feet long uh, that, that were used you know, from, from the late archaic period right on up to European contact in the uh, 1600s. And in addition to the canoes that have been found in the, in the water, there is the associated uh, American Indian material culture, the ceramics, the, the lithics. And everything else, net net weights, uh, gorgets, things like that, that that were you know, found along with the shoreline as well, with habitation that had been there for thousands of years. So, um, we do a lot in partnership with other agencies, regulatory and otherwise. The Cape Fear Comprehensive Survey in 1993 was done as part of the channel improvements in. Uh, for, for the port of Wilmington. And this was done in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers. And so we, we engaged in a magnetometer and side scan sonar survey of, of key areas, uh, activity areas up and down the river, what we thought would be high probability for, for targets. Um, 102 targets were identified, over 150 uh, inspection dives were done. And as a result of this work, 33 new shipwrecks were recorded in the Cape Fear River. Uh, several of them, uh, Civil War period wrecks and a few others, were deemed potentially eligible or actually eligible for National Register status and have been accorded that. Uh, and I, I think the, this is a slide that I did you know, a couple years ago with the, when COVID was first starting up. And uh, one of the wrecks that was discovered was the Civil War blockade runner Kate, the ex Carolina. And we know that for certain because uh, you see a, a close up of one of the plates, fragments of the plates that was recovered from the wreck site uh, that, that has the ship's, uh, ship's logo on it. Uh, but the Kate was the ship that brought yellow fever to Wilmington in 1862. So, you know, it was you know, jokingly say, well, that's the plague ship from back there. And, you know, now we've got COVID in 2020. And so, you know, just kind of that, that little social continuum tie in there that you know, nothing, uh, you know, nothing's new. It just changes, uh, changes the venue and changes the technology of, uh, of what we deal with. Um, but about this time in the, in the mid nineties, we kind of got waylaid by pirates. Um, and, you know, this is lectures and lectures and lectures in and of itself, but the what has proven to be the Queen Anne's Revenge shipwreck, Blackbeard's flagship, which was also uh, really, uh, Blackbeard had it only a year, but it actually plied the waters as a French slaver for, uh, since a, it went as a privateer in, uh, Queen Anne's War, War of Jenkins' Ear, I believe one of those, uh, but it made three slave voyages 
part of the, the triangle trade route uh, in its career between like 1712 and 1717 when it was captured. So it, was, it actually operated as a French slaver longer than it did a, a pirate vessel. So there's a lot of that potential history and context along with this site as well. So a lot of work has been done on this site over, over 5,300 dives over a couple decades. And I highlight here the conservation lab, which uh, was established at, uh, we put it at East Carolina University's West Research Campus where they offered us some space. And we're, we work with them under a memorandum for having our offices there in the lab. It was established in 2003, and that's where all the conservation goes on on, on the artifacts that have come from, from that site. And it's a huge part of uh, what, what we have. And, and the kind of a, a shameless plug, if anybody is looking for something to do next Saturday, the, the 23rd, uh, the lab is actually hosting their open house for the first time in a couple of years because of COVID. Um, that's you know free you know between ten and three free to the public and it it has uh, you can see the artifacts talk to the archaeologists to the conservators and you know get the it's co-sponsored by the uh, North Carolina Science Festival uh, to promote STEM and and learning so there's a lot of educational hands-on stuff for kids but it's also fun for uh, you know we like to you know. You know, whether whether you're eight or eighty, you're going to have fun uh, doing something with this. So um, that sounds fun. But with the in 2012 being the 50th anniversary of the sinking of the modern Greece, the 50th anniversary of the establishment of uh, UAB and its first incarnations, we kind of shifted gears back to Civil War period and revisiting those. A lot of the sites had been looked at over the years, but uh, we did a grant through the National Park Service and spent a couple years basically revisiting all of the, the known civil war wrecks in the area to get consistent documentation, new remote sensing, the technology has improved tremendously. Um, and in the process, one of the targets that was you know, noticed in 1984 off of Oak Island area, the that was mostly buried, horrible visibility. You couldn't see anything. You know, it was suspected to be a shipwreck. Could have been one of two or three Civil War wrecks. It was uh, thought, but in 2016, when the remote sensing was being done, we the image to the right, you can see it was fully exposed, uh, just laying on the bottom, and so we documented. And did some remote sensing on that, came back, partnered up with uh, some other individuals that had some higher level of technology that, than the, we have in-house for uh, sector scanners, like a, a sonar tripod that goes down and, and does sound mapping and put together a, a highly detailed mosaic image of, of the site, which has been identified as the, the Agnes E. Fry, which was, a, was a, 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 one of the blockade runners in the in the latter part of the Civil War, the, uh, we also uh, went back the USS Huron off of Nags Head. The was designated in 1991 as a as a heritage dive site, so to promote education outreach to divers, interested individuals. Uh, the Huron's close enough to shore that you could actually snorkel on it, and a lot of folks out at Nags Head have done that over the, the years since it was established. And the, you know, our conditions here in North Carolina are not as ideal as Florida. So we can't have like the shipwreck trail that, that Florida has with a dozen or so wrecks that are in you know, beautiful shallow water that you can go dive on and you can see everything. Um, but some of our work in the 90s looked at some of the Civil War sites and said, well, what, which ones might be diveable, might be amenable to to making it another heritage dive site. Um, and finally in 2018, uh, the blockade runner Condor was added as the, the second heritage dive site. And this one is, is right off of uh, Fort Fisher, uh, about 500 yards. So it's the, you know, and, and we're hoping as, as things progress, you know, COVID kind of put a kibosh on uh, a lot of our field work, 
So we're hoping to, to keep doing more of things like this. And I mentioned earlier that we had literally more dugout canoes popping up, uh, whether this is because of the hurricane activity and coastal flooding and storm activities. Uh, a lot of these things have, have we've had several you know, literally be found show up. Uh, the one on the left from the South River near, not too far from Fayetteville, uh, was found by, by an individual in the uh, Fayetteville Area History Museum, uh, reached, you know, heard about it and kind of took possession, took responsibility for it and reached out to us. Uh, and, and we picked it up and started the conservation process on it. Um, it now sits at the uh, Kahari Tribal Center in Clinton, where the, you know, our, our policy with, with artifacts and things recovered over the years has always been to try and get the stabilized artifacts back as close as we can to where they were discovered or recovered from uh, in a venue, in a context where they can be you know, obviously properly maintained, but also have the best opportunity to, for education outreach to the community to tell the story. Um, because, you know, the, the last thing we want to do is, you know, just recover something and squirrel it away. It's, it's, it's an artifact. It's a tangible part of telling the story of, of our history or the American Indian history. Um, so, you know, this one's now at the Kahari Travel Center. Um, about, the same, about the same time frame, of, a few months later, we had this large, almost, uh, it's about a 23-foot canoe literally wash up in the shallows at Lake Waccamaw. The uh, Lake Waccamaw State Park let us know. We went out, did some reconnaissance, and it was recovered. It is now finishing conservation at our, uh, at our lab in, uh, at Fort Fisher. And it will, it will be going to uh, UNC Pembroke, to the uh, Museum of the Southeast America, American Indian for display and interpretation there. Um, about a year and a half later, we had another one, another canoe pop up in Lake Waccamaw. It's currently in the works to, to be recovered and that will actually go to the Waccamaw Suan uh, Tribal Center there. Uh, that's the plan for it once the, at, these, at least at this stage, uh, once the conservation is done on that one. That's wild. Those, mm -hmm. those canoes, uh, I mean, it almost looks like you could ride in it. I mean, these things are so remarkably preserved. Uh, the, a, a lot of them are the, the, what a lot of folks have, you know, th this, is, this is technically, you know, South River One or the Autryville canoe because it was Autryville, North, North Carolina, not too far from Fayetteville where it was found. A lot of people have started calling it the Kahari Canoe because it's it's on display at the at the Kahari Tribal Center, and their ancestors would have been, you know, their tribal ancestors would probably have been the ones to have used this in the mm -hmm. South River, Black River, that that area. Uh, but yeah, that one. This is a a beautiful little canoe. It's it's mm -hmm. about probably I think twelve about twelve feet long, and it is very robust, very well built. And I think you probably could toss it in the water and paddle it. Um, you know, it's, it's not in, it's not in perfect shape. It's very, it is delicate, but you know, you do some damage to it, but which we don't want to do, but it, I think it could be paddled. And, uh, That's amazing. but uh, you know, they, they're, they're various states of degradation, but this one obviously was, looks to have been, you know, buried in the mud, of the river and stayed pretty pretty consistent con condition wise, you know, buried anaerobic to you know, to to have good preservation. So and, and it tells a wonderful story. The yeah. and it's it is you know working with the working with the Waccamaw Suan tribe and the Kahari tribe. Um, you know, it's the over the past diligently over the past few years with with some of these canoes, it's it's really interesting. It, interesting, you know, it's rewarding for me to see that uh, the elders in the tribe are seeing 
the excitement in the youth in that, hey, this is our heritage. This is our culture. This is our history. This, this is real because so much of their culture doesn't persist because they lived in uh, harmony with the land. There's, you know, there aren't huge stone foundations left. There aren't buildings or things like what we have. You know, it, it erodes away pretty quickly. But, you know, these are tangible elements that the, that the kids can see and say, wow, you know, my however many great grandfather may have paddled that on the river while they were fishing. And it's no different than me taking my little sit on top kayak out to the river and fishing uh, just like I am now. Um, so it's, it's that tangible connection and that excites the story of you know, history and heritage to the people. So it's, it's all that's that's a fun part other than the, the, the discovery aspect for me of being the first person to see something or find it for, you know, 100 years or 300 years or a thousand years. Um, you know, that's the rewarding tail into the process is, you know, getting this information out, telling the stories and seeing it getting and generating that excitement for the, uh, you know, the next generation to, to appreciate their, their history and their heritage. Well, and what, a, you know, it's, it, what a, uh, uh, a great opportunity to connect the past and the present, you know, the, these examples you have here are centuries old um, mm -hmm. and, you know, how, how much material culture uh, do we have that, that does persist that's a thousand years old, you know, that, that we can tie directly to a place or, or a group of people. This is a, these are great opportunities. It's cool stuff. So, and we'll just kind of roll through the last couple ones here to, you know, we are, North Carolina itself is known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is the, the Gulf Stream, comes up from the south with the warm, clearer waters. Uh, the Labrador Current comes down from the north with the, the colder waters, uh, more murky. And depending on the season of the year, uh, those two currents pretty much meet off of Cape Hatteras, uh, sometimes close in, sometimes farther out. Uh, but that has caused, you know, that in the age of sail, trying to take advantage of the prevailing currents and the prevailing winds um, where the, the currents and the winds would run counter to one another. A lot of the sailing vessels of the late 1800s and, and even before had to hug the coast very, care, very closely along North Carolina to, to come south and make that turn. And, the, and you know, to go along with that, the mixing of the two waters make the sea state and the weather conditions totally unpredictable out there. You know, it can be a, like glass going out in the morning. It can be blowing a gale with, you know, eight foot seas by afternoon. And, you know, they didn't have the benefit of satellite weather radar to say, uh, turn back. There's going to be, you know, it's, it's great now, but there's going to be a small craft advisory uh, later this afternoon. So plan on being back to the sea buoy, you know, before two o'clock kind of thing. Um, they were taken totally unaware in a lot of cases, and a lot of them ended up on our beaches. Uh, and they range from something like, like this with a huge sizable section of one of the big coasting schooners to individual disarticulated timbers. Uh, but because of the presence of these up and down the beach and the, the public walking the beach would see these, would report these, we started a tagging program back in the late 1970s and you see one of the, the old tags that was used and to track these because they bury, they uncover, uh, they wash out, they wash in uh, as, as time goes by. And in even large sections, we've seen migrate as much as a mile or two up or down the beach uh, with, with storm activities. So, you know, this is, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And what we've uh, not only North Carolina, but other states have these beach wrecks as well. And so what we've, we're working on uh, partnering up with a, a graduate student in Florida came up with that acronym STAMP, Shipwreck Tagging Archaeological Management Program. And that was his, he tested different things. And that was kind of his, his MA thesis uh, at the University of West Florida. And, you know, he, he basically worked, 
the idea is the, the park services, National Park Service has already signed on. The state of Texas has, Florida has. The idea is to eventually have a comprehensive program that we can track these timbers and these beach wrecks and such from Texas to Maine all along the East Coast. And just in the Austin's testing process, uh, one of the timbers that he tagged over on uh, the Eastern shore of Virginia showed up at Kurtup. So, you know, one, one of these just kind of disarticulated timbers. So they, they migrate, they wash wow. up, they wash out. So, you know, the, the idea was like, oh, well, North Carolina is North Carolina and Virginia is Virginia. You know, the, I think you and I were talking about it earlier, the, those state lines or the county lines are just arbitrary right. boundaries. They're just a line that somebody drew on a map. It's like a ship or a shipwreck or a ship timber doesn't care where it's, where it's going. Um, so, you know, this, this is something that we're, we're working to kind of update our system from the old yellow fish tags to, a, um, to something with a QR code that the citizen scientist, uh, the, the beach walker can, can literally go to and take a picture of it with their cell phone. It'll take them to a little database form and it'll, you know, where it can say, well, you know, what's your location? You know, do you want to share your location with your cell phone? We'll, we'll fill it in for you. Um, you know, take some pictures, you know, describe it and just upload it to the, to the database, which would then be shared. So we're, um, a more effective way of, of tracking these and also the ability to, to then link that QR code uh, to a website where someone could say, well, here's, here's what we think it might be. Um, you know, this could have been part of this vessel or the, here's one of the candidates that it could have been. Um, you know, thanks for, thank you for helping us with the progress and the, and the tracking of this. So, you know, taking advantage of new technology to, to talk to uh, uh, or, or to, to build our data. Yeah, that sounds like a great program. And it's also, you know, it's like, well, how often does this happen? Like, well, we have currently, um, some folks may have seen it in the, in the local newspapers, um, I believe back in January, uh, this is a shipwreck fragment that is on Baldhead Island right near the point that no one knew about, um, that just washed out of the dune, uh, that it, it had been there for, uh, you know, who knows how long, at, at least 100 years, probably. And so, you know, we, we went down and did some initial archaeological reconnaissance and some documentation on it. The, you know, see two, two of our archaeologists there, you know, getting, this is at low tide. High tide, it's actually a wash with uh, a wash with water and mostly uh, mostly underwater. The uh, but getting some initial information on this and some documentation and uh, this this one is slated to have some some more complete uh, documentation done on it. Uh, actually, by a professional archaeological consultant. That's that's the thought at this point as it moves forward. So we'll we'll learn more about it as they do more in depth research. Um, we're continuing our work with uh, East Carolina University, uh, Maritime Studies. We've been doing work along the Brunswick Town shoreline. Uh, they've been doing a, a uh, shoreline protection program to, uh, with wave attenuators offshore, uh, but we've also been working to do some more uh, uh, higher resolution side scan sonar. In the process, we've, we've confirmed or, or confirmed the exact locations of, of two of the southern wharfs that were known about from Stan South's maps and such, but uh, we know pretty much uh, exactly where they were uh, and have a lot of uh, targets that we can put divers down on uh, as, as time allows that may be remnants of shipwrecks, maybe ballast piles, then something of that nature. But you know, in a nutshell, you know, we, our office has been around this year, uh, about 60 years. And I've, I've been there for 22 years of it. The, but to, to date, we have, based on historical documents and primary and secondary resources, uh, over 5,200 historically, historic shipwreck losses in North Carolina waters. 
uh, in the rivers along the outer banks and along the things of that nature. And, you know, we have, um, this is an older slide, so it's probably more, I'm sure it's more than that now. We have over a thousand recorded, documented underwater archaeological sites, um, whether it's a, a dugout canoe, whether it's a submerged wharf structure uh, or an interface site uh, or an actual shipwreck. Uh, so it's uh, a bunch of stuff. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I imagine no two things are the same, which is... Uh... Oh yeah, ab absolutely, and and that's that's one of the, the wonderful things about this job is you know every day is potentially different, mm -hmm. uh, some something new to see, something new to figure out, and uh, as as what we're doing and you know archaeology, you know when we give lectures and talk about things is uh, one one of the things, especially underwater archaeology, we we like to kind of liken it to is you know, we're everybody likes the the csi shows and, you know, and things of that nature what we do is a, a lot of the same thing is you know, we're looking at the the remnants of activity what people left behind either on purpose or, or by accident just incidental to under to basically look at the crime scene and put together what happened at the crime scene you know, we're looking at the artifacts and we're using those artifacts to reconstruct what they were doing, how they were living you know, at that time, whether it was 3000 years ago with American Indians or whether it was, you know, even 30 or 40 years ago uh, with a, you know, with a 20th century house site that, yeah. you know, we, that we come across. This is fascinating stuff. I have a ton of questions and I, um, oh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try to narrow them down, but I'd like, um, I think maybe just if, a few things, you know, someone, uh, one of our viewers commented about, uh, says that I think she uh, used to dive wrecks of so cool, uh, you know, Dovid mags had the undercurrent there as fears. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess one of the questions is like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with, a little familiar with terrestrial archaeology. How, I mean, aside from the risk of death, I mean, how is, the, <laughs> how is the, the work more difficult in this environment? Or can you, can you just tell a little bit about like what it's like to, to gear up and, and uh, hit the bottom? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, what, what we do is, you know, is classified as, as scientific and depending on our tasks, sometimes working diving, uh, like, a, like a commercial diver as well, that we're, we're not welding or, or cutting or that type of thing. Um, but, you know, scuba diving for us is... It, it becomes not, it's always of, made, of primary importance because of safety, but the scuba diving itself becomes secondary to us. That's just our way to get where we need to work. Uh, so, you know, the, the training that our divers have, the experience that they have is, you know, well, well above and beyond what a, a recreational diver would have. Um, and which, which is one of our challenges when we have, you know, interested individuals that want to volunteer with us. Um, it's like, well, the, it's going to take some, you know, unless you were a former commercial diver, public safety diver, or something like that, it's going to take additional, a lot of additional work and commitment on your part. You know, would love to have you, but, you know, it's, it's going to, it's going to be work on both our parts to get you to the, to the level of the stage that you need. But, but in terms of doing the work, um, you know, we're, you know, we wear, you know, 50 pounds of gear, um, you know, just getting, you know, we're virtually weightless once we're in the water, but, you know, 50, 50 so pounds of gear just to get where we're going, uh, different levels of, of thermal protection, because uh, even in 80 degree water, if you stay for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, your body starts cooling off. Um, so you, you need the thermal protection. But, you know, most of the principles that we have are, are pretty much the same. The, we do the actual mapping that we do is, you know, uh, slates instead of clipboards. Uh, we put mylar waterproof paper, Tyvek paper on the slates so we can write on them, take them off, photocopy them, that type of thing after the fact. Um, you know, normal pencils, um, tape measures and, you know, rulers. 
we do the same type of you know plan view mapping and photo and video photo and video visibility allowing um, that an archaeologist would do on land. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we have is we don't use a shovel and a trowel. Um, in shallow water environments, we actually use a, a water induction dredge system, which uses a water pump and a venturi uh, venturi pipe. Uh, that causes, uh, basically creates an underwater vacuum for us. So we can vacuum the sediments off of the, carefully off the artifacts. And then the outflow from that passes through a screen or passes through a, a staged sluice system, depending on what type of work we're doing. Uh, so all of the artifacts that we might not see under underwater and depending on conditions and the visibility, um, you know, are still collected and, and, and we can document that, but we, we still excavate by, uh, by test units and run transects just the same, it's the same as we would. Um, challenges to that, you know, you add current and you add, in a lot of cases, our jurisdiction, a lot of the dive sites have poor visibility. Uh, you know, I, if I can see, you know, a foot or two in front of me, I'm happy because I can actually see the map or work, see what I'm working on with a light usually. Um, but if you've got better visibility, some of the things like the photo documentation or shooting video is actually easier. But you can literally float right over top of what you're looking at in yeah. a plan view that you know, on, on land, uh, drones have changed the game a, right. big, a big time by having the, the, you know, the look down plan view shot. But it, you know, it used to be you'd you know get a couple step ladders and string them up and right. put a board across it and you're teetering out and it's like <laughs> I remember many projects you know it's like oh, okay I'm up here with a camera it's like hope I don't fall off kind of thing trying to get the, the perfect plan view shot down of the excavations and, and things like that but the but you know the the techniques vary somewhat but the principle under the underlying principles still apply um, but you know sense. we just have we just have a challenge more challenging environment. To, uh, to work in in a lot of cases. Yeah, that sounds, I, I can't even imagine, I, as we talked before, I'm, I'm glad to leave this work to other people. I, will, I don't I mean, think I would be a participant. I, 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 we'll, we'll get you out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get you certified. Yeah. Until I grow gills. Um, can you tell us, um, what is it, What's it like to discover something? You mentioned before about you know the the thrill of being the first to lay eyes on something in a long time. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. I guess it's 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 one of those things that the you know archaeology in general, but even underwater archaeology is uh, especially because you know you know we're you're always diving with a buddy, but in a lot of cases you know your buddy's over here working close by, and you're over here, so you know you're you're doing your own thing. And, you know, when you're, you know, you're, you're excavating out and it's like, you know, you find something, um, you know, the, in, you know, the a whole, you know, you're not expecting it all. It's like, oh, wow, there's a whole glass onion bottle from, you know, the early 1700s. And it's like, one, you're thinking, why is it whole? on the bottom of the ocean. It's like, how did it last this long? But then you're like, oh, this is really cool. It's like, to, because in a lot of cases, the, the preservation underwater is better than it is on land. Uh, because again, artifacts don't like change. So if you have hot to cold, wet to dry on a terrestrial site, it leads to the, the change leads to faster degradation. But if you mm -hmm. have it, buried in the sediment or the sand, constantly wet, relatively consistent temperature. Uh, in a lot of cases, it preserves much better. But you know, that, yeah, the, the thrill of discovery and finding, you know, again, being, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, the, you know, it's like you realize it's like, wow, the last person that touched this, you know, was some colonial guy on, the wharf at Brunswick Town, right. or it's like you know, or just or a, you, know, you find a piece of a shoe, and it's like, I wonder who wore this. Yeah. And you know, you and your mind, you know, as you know, as, as scientists and and 
historians and archaeologists, you know, they were told, you know, don't let our biases come in. But at the same time, letting your mind run is like, what if, what if, what if, what if? It's like one of the things that we use in underwater archaeology is something called multiple working hypothesis. You come up with, with as many different possibilities of what could explain this. And then you start systematically eliminating. Sure. And by process of elimination, what you have left might be, not, not definitely, but might be the answer. So, you know, that, you know, having that imagination, you know, envisioning yourself, you know, being that guy walking along the, the wharfs at Brunswick Town and, you know, slipping and falling into the water and, oh, your shoe went off and it's like, oh, crap. <laughs> It's stuck now, in the now, tar. Now, now, now it's, 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 it's down in the river. I'm not going down there and getting it because, hey, I, I don't know how to swim. Um, right. You know, most people back then, you know, even sailors couldn't swim. It's like they're looking like, I'm not going. It's like, now what do I do with one shit? It's like, <laughs> it's going to be cold in the winter. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But, you know, you, you run all those scenarios in your head and just like, this is cool. This is, you know, this is one of the, the things like that is what makes the, administrative makes the regulatory side of things that is you know critical to our job as well you know yeah. from the review and compliance of the federal and state laws to protect the resources you know we we're, we're lucky that we get to balance it out with some field work and, and some actual archaeology of, of that discovery you know the, the feeling's amazing yeah i can't imagine i've, I've scraped up something uh, out of the soil before but uh Nothing as exciting as that. Um, so if we extend this scenario, um, you've geared up, you've uh, gone to the bottom, excavated something or uncovered something is I don't mm -hmm. um, And then you decide that we're going to return this item to the surface and conserve it. Um, I can only imagine that conservation has changed some in the 60 years that the um, underwater archaeology branch has been around. Can, mm -hmm. can you tell us just a little bit about, um, and, and I don't know how big or small a question I'm actually asking you right now, but um, uh, how has conservation changed over the past several decades? The, uh, you know, I, I go, I always seem to go back to the, the whole idea of principles and techniques. You have the principles, you know, if you have, if you understand the principles, you have an infinite number of techniques that can be applied. Um, so, you know, the, the principles of conservation haven't really changed. The idea is that you want it, you want to stabilize, archaeologically, you want to stabilize it with minimal, minimal change to the object uh, as it was found. And you ideally want the process of conservation to be reversible. So again, like, like you're saying, it's like in, in the canoes are a perfect example. Back in the, the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, uh, sucrose was used, uh, literally sugar, to you know, bulk up the, the waterlogged wood for, to stabilize it so it wouldn't collapse and warp and, and degrade when it was dehydrated. The, that, of course, had you know, all manner of problems because of, you know, it's, it's the, one of the, the joking titles that was, you know, the kind of the Rocky and Bullwinkle titles that was given at one of the uh, archeology span conferences back in the day was the candy canoes of Carolina uh, because the prehistoric canoes were, were sucrose treated, they were sugar treated. So, you know, the mice, the roaches, everything love to nibble on it, because it's a great snack. Um, you know, and it caught, and it's, it's, you know, technology evolved, techniques evolved uh, to, you know, polyethylene glycol, a, a carbo wax is one of the manufacturer names that used to, the proprietary names used to be way back in the day. It's like, but it's, you know, it's a, a soluble wax that then does the same thing. It penetrates into the wood, it stabilizes it. So, you know, the, the techniques change for the treatment, you know, technology is drastically improved. You know, we've got x-ray, we've got um, uh, the tools like the XRF, which can scan it and basically determine what elements are coming off of it. So mm -hmm. our, our, our lab in Greenville has actually worked with the library on some of their historic books that have come in 
you know, doing testing to say, oh, yes, um, you need to be careful with this one. The, the green lettering on the spine contains arsenic, you know, one of, one of the pigments that, we, you know, mixes that yeah. were done for the pigments back in the day. So, um, but the, yeah, the, the conservation process from bringing the object up, keeping it wet, you know, to do the, you know, if it came from salt water, the desalinization and the, the cleaning and the stabilization to then be able to, de to dehydrate it and then get it to, uh, you know, get into a, a state where it can either be stored archivally or transferred to a museum for, for display and interpretation. And, uh, you know, we've, the, science is, the science has evolved greatly in the years to say, well, we know the optimum, the exact optimum humidity and, mm -hmm. you know, the relative humidity, the temperature that's going to be ideal uh, for this, as opposed to, well, yeah, it looks good. And, you know, back in the sixties, <laughs> it looks good. I think it's yeah. done. It look, looks pretty good. I, I like it. it. It'll, it'll be good on display. And it was for, you know, five, 10 years, 15 years. And it's kind of like, yeah, well, that's why we make conservation reversible. We come back and it's like, yeah, it didn't work as well as we had hoped. Let's right. let's take what we know now and 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 fix it, or if we can. Some in some cases you can. Some cases that's a lot more challenging, depending on the, sure. the object. But yeah, the conservation process can be some things can be relatively straightforward and quick with ceramics. Uh, they're relatively water resistant. Other things, you know, cannons, organics, wood can take years. Um, you know, the, the monitor in Newport News, the turret that came from the monitor, um, you know, 100, 100 plus years on the bottom has now been in active conservation for this year marks 20 years since its recovery. And it's still an ongoing process. So because, wow. you know, it's, it's a huge, yeah. huge, you know, turret on on a ship. Um, so, yeah, it's it is it is a and that's one of the things from from the underwater perspective is the long-term commitment that we have for the preservation stabilization of, of the artifacts is, you know, we have to keep that in mind when we recover something. And that really dictates, you know, we advocate for minimal disturbance, non-disturbance archeology, span if it's safe where it is environmentally development wise, you know, we'll document it as best we can and kind of leave it alone. Because it's, you know, it's been there for 100 years or 1,000 years. It's probably safe where it is. We don't need to disturb it, cause that change, which causes degradation to start again. And uh, you know, then, you know, it's kind of like the old original Wheel of Fortune uh, back in the day. Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. You know, no, no backsies. Uh, you can't change your mind. It's the same thing. Once this is recovered, we can't put it back. We're, right. we're you know, ethic, ethically and everything else, we can't put this back. We're, we're responsible for it in perpetuity. So that has to be accounted for and planned for with projects that you do and the recoveries that you do. So it's, it's, it's the conservation and the stabilization and the long-term curation is, can be a huge aspect. Yeah. And that makes sense. And that, you know, that ties into what you said before about that shift from uh, uh, sort of individual site, um, exploration to mm -hmm. resource protection as a as a comprehensive yep. philosophy. Um, I, I could ask you a, a dozen more questions, uh, but I, we'll, uh, I think we'll lose ourselves and, and we could be here for hours. Um, I guess last question for you um, and give you an opportunity to, to share some final thoughts. Suppose somebody is, uh, beachcombing or, or just, you know, on vacation or, or they're in their boat fishing and they find something that they think um, might be a, an archaeological remain. What do you recommend they do? The uh, best course of action on for, for any archaeological site or something that you, you come across is, um, you know, take some pictures, if, you know, depending on the situation that you're at, you know, take some pictures, document what you have, what you see, but ideally leave it in place and, and reach out to us, um, you know, via phone, via email. Um, and, you know, we get, we get constituent calls, uh, citizen calls on a routine basis. Hey, I found this, this washed up on the beach. What is it? Or, 
you know, I saw this and, you know, we, um, you know, we respond to those and, you know, and, and reach back out. And in a lot of cases, you know, that they end up being sites and further work is done. And, you know, sometimes they're, as archaeologists say, they're isolated finds. It's just a really interesting artifact. But even having that, the information about that isolated find, um, what's being found and where, by knowing that can help us to build that broader context of, of understanding of what was going on, where people were. It kind of goes back to uh, earlier in, the, in our chat where, oh yeah, well, these 37 shipwrecks that are along the Wilmington waterfront, you know, who would have thought that what they are, they added as contributing elements to the historic district because they helped tell the story of Wilm historic Wilmington as a seaport and, you know, and the, and the length of activity. So, you know, nothing, uh, nothing is insignificant. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, just, just re you know, if you find something, you know, note the location, reach out uh, and, and try not to, you know, if at all possible, try not to disturb it. And you know, we'll get back to you as soon as possible and, and take a look at it and, and see how, how best it needs to proceed. Excellent. That is great and helpful advice. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. We should do this again sometime and, and I'll save up my, uh, my list of other questions. We can, we can have part two. <laughs> I can say ab absolutely. It's, it's been a lot of fun. It's like, you know, the, the, uh, uh, I, I, I enjoyed, you know, I, I can, you know, as, as you're saying, I can talk about this for hours and hours. So, you know, cause it's, it's what I do. It's what I love uh, is, is doing, doing things like this. Well, that's great. Well, thanks, Chris. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll see you again um, this time next month. Mm -hmm.